Well, I would agree. Wonderful singing tonight and wonderful choices of music tonight. And it has uh, been a phenomenal day of just being able to join our voices together in worshiping of our Lord. I, uh, I hesitate to say this, but there are times in which I will uh, go to church and I feel like uh, the uh, prelude to the preaching has just kind of been at the last minute thrown together and somebody quickly found some songs and said, yeah, why don't we sing this? And can the pianist play that? Yeah, well, we'll sing that. And I, and I don't know motives behind other ministries, and I don't mean to be critical, but I said that to say it has been incredible to be a part of a church service all day today in which uh, we have been carefully led in worship of our Master and King. And we've been brought to the attention at the beginning to say, hey, let's cast aside all those other thoughts and let's behold our God. And uh, we've been able to do that. I... Uh, I think, I think one of these nights, I'm going to just sit right in the midst of the orchestra just so I can have their music. Just kind of, I'm not going to. If you're playing over there, don't get nervous. But uh, someone stick an instrument in my hand, I wouldn't know what to do with it. So I, I won't bother you. But I just love all of the uh, musicians, m musicians. I just made that word up. Who knows? It may be a real word, and we don't know. I tell my wife all the time, you made that word up. Uh, I... Uh, I, 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 I've appreciated the musicians and I've appreciated the choice of music and I've appreciated and enjoyed joining our voices together. Kyle and Christy, just incredible song. Thank you. I wanted to hit the replay button and have you sing that again because it ministered to our hearts. And I just, just greatly appreciate everything. It's been wonderful. It's been a great day, hasn't it? It's been super. And I hope you came for the preaching and not for the ice cream tonight. I, I really do. Uh, I hope that... Uh, Hope that you came to hear some things from the Word of God. Lynn and I just had the joy of meeting so many of you here uh, this morning and uh, having the opportunity to uh, get to know a few of you and get some names and faces as you were departing and as we were quickly saying a, a hello and, and goodbye and all like that. So we want to get to know you even better. I owe you an apology and I really am sorry about this. I got back to the room and started looking over my notes and I, I think I made a mistake uh, this morning, and I do need to clarify it and make sure you understood. I may have said it correctly, but I'm not real sure. And so if I did or I didn't, let me make sure it's straight tonight. Here's what I think I said. Here's what I meant to say, okay? Remember that tomorrow night is the most important night of this meeting. I think that's maybe what I said, but I'm not real sure. But if I said something similar, I'm glad you're here tonight, but don't miss tomorrow night. You just can't miss it, all right? Hope that you'll plan to come. You say, well, I'll have to walk in late. Well, I told the men in Sunday school, that won't bother me. Just come on in. And uh, we won't stop and look at you as you walk all the way to your seat, you know, somewhere and, and, uh, and watch you walk in or whatever. You just come right on in. And uh, we'll look forward to having you here. And uh, tomorrow night, there's a, I think uh, this morning, uh, it was told to us that we will have an emphasis upon, uh, where I'm going to have the joy of meeting with some teenagers before the service. And then uh, the other two nights are some kind of some emphasis. But that doesn't mean if you're not a part of one particular ministry team that you're not needed or welcome. We want you here. Everybody needs to be here. Plan to be here. Let's let the Lord bring a season of refreshment to all of our hearts, okay? You've been a refreshment to us uh, today, and I want to be an encouragement and a blessing to you. So would you take your Bibles tonight and turn to the book of 1 Peter, if you would, and get chapter 5 opened up in front of you. 1 Peter chapter 5, and there in the, in the New Testament, we're going to go there tonight for a few moments. Now, if I heard correctly, Pastor said he's got college kids uh, over there running the children's meeting. I can sort of see through the glass window. So those of you who have children over there, don't worry about it. I did just see some bow and arrows come out, but I don't want that to be a bother to you. I think the kids will be fine. And uh, seriously, it'll be just fine, I'm sure. And uh, then we'll have a good time of fellowship in just a little bit after the service. You know, as I sought the mind of the Lord as to what we needed to look at together tonight, I, I, I didn't have an argument with the Lord, but I just, I just truly said, now, Lord, are we certain? Are you certain this is the direction you'd have us to go? And I'm as convinced as I can be tonight that if there's an area and arena that keeps us from being people of, 
of spiritual alertness and spiritual awakening in our own life to where we don't get we, we don't slip into a dormancy and a complacency. It's the arena within which we're going to look at tonight. When Peter wrote his two epistles, they were written near the same time frame. He wrote them to friends that had been scattered abroad as a result of heavy, heavy persecution. Persecution as a result of, of the, the fact that the, the Caesar of Rome at the time was that guy that has been called crazy. His name was Nero. Nero was a, was a guy in which literally he did burn. He did order for much of Rome to be burnt down. Because historians tell us that, that, that Nero had this uh, insatiable craving for building buildings. He loved the construction of buildings. And he loved to, to orchestrate the, the, the new, uh, uh, new structures of buildings. And when they in Rome, ran out of space to build, he commanded that much of Rome be burnt down so he could level it down and rebuild. And as a result of his burning of Rome, people lost their lives. People certainly lost friends. They lost their, their uh, employment. They lost much of their life as a result of the destruction of the city of Rome. And when the Roman citizens rose up in anger and in fury and began to cry out and say, you know, Rome, our government has done this disastrous deed to us, Nero deflected the responsibility and said, no, no, it's not the government that did this. No, it's this new sect that we find in our Gentile world. It's this new group of people that followed that, that Christ fella." those Christians. And there was a rise in persecution that began to just indoctrinate the, the entire area and God's people began to suffer greatly. I mean, greatly. I don't even have time to tell you some of the suffering they went through. Certainly, the arenas were filled with, with people of Rome as they watched uh, God's people being slaughtered by animals, persecuted and whipped and beaten to death. And then they decided, they decided they wanted to have some night games. This is almost too horrible for me to express. But they would take some of our forefathers and dip them in oil and pitch of some sort and strap them to post and then light them aflame to provide light so they could have night games. When Peter wrote his letters, he could almost sense the fear, the hurt, the battle of hatred, the, the confusion of God's people. I think there's no reason to doubt that the play on words when he said, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. Then he said, but rejoice that ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings. Most of these martyrs that we read about both in scriptures and even after the fact, it is quite unusual the, the amount of grace that was given to them as they expressed their willingness to die as a result of being a follower of Jesus Christ. And I'm convinced that if we ever got to that, if that place in our own history, I'm convinced that the Lord would give us the needed grace for that hour to go through such suffering. But that's not to say that we don't know anything about suffering in life. And so these people, they literally had to meet in some cases without, uh, like it's so in many of our parts of the globe where God's people gather in secrecy and because of fear of being caught by the government within which they find themselves living. Peter wrote to these people who many times met in secretive places out of fear for their life. He even referred to the church at Babylon 
There was no real literal church in the area of Babylon at the time of Peter's writing. It was a it was a nickname. It was a secretive name referring to the church at Rome. It was no doubt Peter's way and uh, other people's communicating way to protect the believers. Because if he ever if it ever fell in the wrong hands and he referred to the church at Rome, then the Roman government might begin to break it up and decide to even bring further persecution. And when Peter is writing these letters, he even said in his second epistle, he said, both of my epistles I have written. Now listen to this. He said, I've written them to, hear this, stir up the believers by way of remembrance. What's he saying? He's saying, I want you to be, are you ready? Revived to hang on to what you've been taught before. You see, friends, revival is nothing spooky. Revival is not getting some, oh, oh, some feeling all over you. Don't ever get the idea that revival is some sense of, of getting some kind of spiritual chill bumps. There's no such animal. Revival is simply a refreshment, a restoring up, a, a return to Bible principles that we've learned before that somewhere along the way we've maybe forgotten or we've gotten sleepy in those arenas. And so Peter writes his friends and he says, I write both of my epistles to stir up within you by way of reminding you of what you've been taught before. And we come to this chapter of what we call chapter five. Peter is rounding the corner in this first epistle and he's giving some basic fundamentals of, of the Christian life and he's reminding the pastor shepherds. He's reminding them as to how they are to uh, shepherd the flock in the first five verses there. He tells them to be the leader that they need and to, to lead and to feed the flock of God. And then he says, if you'll pick it up there, if you would please, in verse five, he says, likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. In other words, he's saying, have the right kind of relationship with your spiritual leaders. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. I think he's truly trying to make a point. He mentions the word humble over the, over the space of just a few words. Be humble. That's, that's one of those portions of Scripture that one size fits all. It's without doubt the need of our heart. And he says at the end of verse 6, he says, well, the whole verse 6 says, uh, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. In other words, God is in control of what's happening in your life. So put yourself under his divine care that he may exalt you in due time. The idea there does not mean that he may exalt you. And everybody looks at you as super Christian. I am somebody special. He has exalted you. That's not what he's talking about. The word exalt there means that he may lift you up, which is the understanding that there has been a season or there has been an event. There has been a spirit within you that has caused you to fall. You have stumbled. There is struggles in your life. But the Lord, if you say, Lord, I know you're in charge and humble yourselves under his mighty hand, he'll lift you back up. He will defend you. We sang that tonight. And then he says in verse 7, casting all your care upon him for he careth for you. Be sober. Be vigilant. That is, be on the alert because your adversary, and that's exactly what he is. He's our, he's our enemy, number one adversary, the devil. As a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. I've often told teenagers that in the wild, the, the lion, the wild animals like the lion, goes at, they go after two different groups. They go after young. They go after young animals to attack them that can't get away from them. And they go after a wounded animal that can't get away from them. And he says here, be on the alert. Because just like a lion in the wild goes after you and goes after wild animals and goes after uh, the hurt and, the, and those who are young. He says, be on the alert, be vigilant because your adversary seeketh whom he may devour. And then he says in verse 9, whom resist 
steadfast. That means faithfully. Stay at it. Even when you don't have the strength, stay steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make, make you perfect. That word means to be complete, that he's, he's completing something in you. He'll make you perfect. Establish, strengthen, settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Father, I pray for your help tonight. Please help us to be aware that you're meeting needs. Lord, I may not even ever find out what it is that has been needed in tonight's message for these, my new friends. But you, of course, are in charge. And I thank you for what you're going to do. Bless our time together around your word. Don't let me get in the way and mess things up. Please do for us tonight what is desperately needed. We ask it in your wonderful name. Amen. Uh, my uh, wife travels with me uh, almost year round, and uh, we go from place to place and I primarily try to drive to all my meetings so that we can stay together. Occasionally a, a pastor will say, can I, can I get you to come to our church? And it may be just, a, you know, in, across the country to where I don't have time to drive to it. He says, well, I'll fly you. And so occasionally I have to fly to meetings and so forth. And at those times, uh, usually Lynn does not go because we don't put the, the expense of, of, a, of a church of a two plane tickets unless they're willing to do so. And so many times she stays at home during those times or she'll go home during those times. The time that she really is at home is primarily in the summer. In the summer months for about eight weeks, I'm privileged to preach to teenagers at various youth camps across the country. It's a great privilege. I often will say this, that at the beginning of the summer, at the end of May, as June comes along, I say this, I am so ready to spend time with just teenagers. By the end of August, I'm saying, I am so ready to get back into churches. I'm worn out. I'm just so tired of hanging out with teenagers and running around with them. But the truth is, during those summer months, because of the fact that I'm all over the nation, uh, there's no rhyme or reason. I may be in Georgia one month and the next month in Michigan and the next month in California and the next month back over here in New Hampshire, next month uh, you know, down in Louisiana. And so I have to fly to a lot of meetings. And so I try to drive to as many as possible, but usually I'm having to fly to a lot of them. So in the summer... While I'm at camps, Lynn will spend time at our home. And she just takes that as a time to, uh, to work on a home project. And I will usually get home. And a lot of times I will get home in between those camp weeks. And, and I, I'll be there for just a, a couple of days and then take off to my next meeting. So you got the picture. She has a car at the house because I'm out on the highway and I'm driving. And then when I got to get on a plane, I'll park at an airport and jump on the plane and fly. Well, she's got this car at home a few years back. She had this project all set up. She was going to paint a couple of rooms and she was going to make some drapes for, uh, I think, our bedroom or something somewhere. She was going to make some curtains. And so she had it all fixed up and everything. And of course, her time is limited for those few weeks. She's got to get all this knocked out as well as anything else she wants to do in the summer. Well, she found out that Sherwin Williams had a sale on at, at the local paint shop for just one day. Now, ladies, you know the, the term sale. A couple of you went, ding. I mean, I mean, you just said, oh, oh, look how much money I saved by going to the sale. And your husband's thinking, I know a better way to save. But anyway, uh, anyway, I'm just joking, of course. And, and so Lynn, Lynn said on this particular day, I got to get to Sherwin-Williams and pick up this paint because uh, and I, I, I'm going to be able to get some paint for our house. And it was a great idea. It really was. She got in her car, which doesn't get driven very much and she was backing backing out of our driveway and started going forward and it made the most horrible sound in the world screeching and squawking and making all kinds of racket and she did nothing else but pull back up and go out into the garage and called me i was in california about 1800 to 2000 miles away and she said morris something's wrong with the car I said, what? She goes, yeah, I just was going out. You know, there's a sale on it, Sherman Williams. I said, you mentioned that. And I said, yes. And she said, I, I got I to gotta get there, but something's wrong with the car. And I don't, I don't want to break down. What am I going to do? I said, well, and I'm not a mechanic by any stretch. And I said, well, 
what's it doing? She said, it's making a horrible sound, screeching and scratching and squawking. And I said, underneath the hood? No, it sounds like it's coming maybe probably from around the wheels. I said, well, that's probably brake pads are going bad. I said, I do know that. And I said, that's all it is. And I said, it always lets you know that they need to be replaced, but you can still drive a little bit of distance. I said, you're fine. Drive it up to a, a road where there's a couple of mechanics up that way. And I said, just drive it up there. And she said, no, nope, I'm, I'm not getting out in that car. I could break down. And she said, no, I'm, that's just not safe. And I said, no, it probably isn't. I said, so that's, that's not a good idea. She said, what am I going to do? Now, every husband in this room knows the feeling in your heart. You want to solve it. I'm 2,000 miles away. I couldn't say, oh, I'll be right there. You know, I couldn't get there. And I said, well, uh, I don't know. She said, you know, there's a sale on it. Sure. I said, yes, I, I'm well aware of that sale down at Sherwin-Williams. I'm certainly aware of it. She said, I got to get there before the day gets along. I've got to get, I've got all, she had a list of things she had to do. I said, I know, sweetheart, I don't know what to do. She said, well, what, I, I got to get going, Morris. I can't be strapped to the house. I said, I, I know. And I'm thinking to myself, I don't know what to tell her. I mean, we're never hardly ever at home. So I don't know a mechanic to say, hey, can you just run over to the house and take a look at the, my wife's car? I, I, I didn't know what to do. Now, we, did ha we do have two sons, and they both lived in that city where we were at the time. And I thought, okay, one of them is a youth pastor at a church. He doesn't know anything. Of, he can't break loose. He's, uh, he doesn't know anything about mechanic work anymore, and his dad knows. And the other one, is he's got a secular job. And I said, he, he's, he never even answers his phone when I call. He's just so swamped at work, and so there's nothing he can do. But I don't know what to do. And I finally, I just said, Lynn, I said, let me just hang up and think about it. I don't know what to tell you. She said, okay, well, get back to me. I said, I promise I will. We hung up. And I just literally said, God, I don't know what to do. I mean, seriously, Lord, this is a need. Can you tell me what to do? I don't know what to do. And just on a whim, I decided to call my one son who's got a job at a, at a fa not a factory, but in a, a place where it was a manufacturing company. And, and so I just said, He'll ne he won't answer the phone. But I called his cell phone and lo and behold, he answered. I said, Chad, buddy, I said, I can't believe you answered. He said, yeah, dad, I'm going on break. And I said, hey, and I told him what I just told you, told him this story. And I said, look, I, I know you don't know anything. I know you can't do anything about it. I said, I just needed somebody to talk to. That maybe you got an idea or something. I don't know what to do. He said, dad, I got it. I said, you got what? He said, I'll solve it. I'll take care of it. I'll take care of mom. I said, no, I said, son, there's a sale on it, Sherwin-Williams. I said, <laughs> it, it needs to be taken care of right away. He said, dad, I'll take care of it. I said, what do you mean you'll take care of it? You're at work. He said, dad, I'm going on break. He said, I'll drive my car right now to mom. She can have my car and do whatever she needs to. He said, I'll drive her car back up here to the shop. He said, I got two mechanics that work for us here in the shop. He said, at lunch... We'll take her brakes apart and figure out what they need, what she needs. And we'll go down to the local auto parts and buy the parts. I said, who's going to buy the parts? He said, I'll buy the parts. I said, who is this? And, and <laughs> what'd you do with my son? He said, dad, I'll pay for it. I'll buy the parts. And I said, are you serious? He said, we'll get the car repaired, fix it after hours. And I'll take the car back to her after I get off work. And she can give me back her car. She can do what she needs to do. Now, again. The male in me is trying to be a part of the solution. And I've done nothing. I, I, I cannot do anything. And I just said, well, but, but um, well, what do, I, what do you need me to do? He gave me a classic answer. I said, son, what do you need me to do? He said, hang up the phone. <laughs> I said, no, 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 seriously, what do you need me to do? He said, dad, I can't tell mom I'm on my way if I'm tied up talking to you. He said, I can't. He goes, you go do what you do. Go preach. He said, I'll take care of mom. You gave it to me. I'll take care of it. Now, I want you to read a verse with me again tonight that you have read so many times, you almost don't even have to look at it because you've got it practically memorized. Look at verse 7. And listen to what God just tells you here in this one verse. 
casting all your care upon him for he careth for you. Peter was writing to friends who couldn't figure out what's going on. Why is this happening to us? You know, there's a lot of things that happen in life you don't ever know the answer for. Is that not correct? You don't understand why things are going bad. You don't understand why things seem to be in a state of confusion. You can't understand the, the reason why the doctor said what he said. You can't understand why the bill that came in the mail. You can't understand. I don't understand. Is God mad at me? And our mind begins to travel down highways. And again, the man, the male in so many of us tonight, we like to figure out why and figure out and solve things and, and, try, and try to discern what we need to do to solve it. And there are times in our life, in all of our lives, in which you're not going to come up to a conclusion. And I'm going to tell you something, friends. Hope is not found in knowing why something is going the way it's going. And if I can understand why, then I'll have hope. Hope is found in Jesus Christ, period. Whether we know why or not. And Peter is saying to these folks, I know that you're hurting. I know that you don't understand. I know that you're confused. I know that it's been a set of dark days. I know you don't know what the future holds. But don't let it take away your rejoicing. Can I repeat it? He said, Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you, but, are you ready? Rejoice. When I was a kid growing up in church like Community Baptist Church, I mean, this is a crowd I've always known. This is the only crowd I've ever been around with. Straight, forward, Bible preaching, Bible teaching churches. I used to look at adults. When I was a little kid, I used to look at adults and I'd think, man, they must be miserable. They must be so, I mean, what's going, you know, everything in the world's going wrong. We'd stand up and sing, we have heard the joyful sound, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. And I go, really? <laughs> but when you're a kid, when you're a kid, you know what you're always thinking? I wish I was older. I can't wait till I'm a teenager. You become a teenager. I can't wait till I'm out of high school. When you're out of high school, I can't wait till I got my own job. I can't wait. I, and you're always wishing and wishing and wishing that you could be something else. You become an adult. You know what you do? Boy, life sure was simple when I was a kid. <laughs> Boy, I tell you, life was so much easier. And nobody ever seems to enjoy life. You can't ever seem to enjoy the stage and age of life. We'd have some missionaries, and, and I love missionaries. They'd come to our church, and honestly, most of the time, they would fire me up as a kid, and I'd think, wow, that person goes all the way to places that I'll never go to. Wow, they're on the other side of, the, of that globe that's in my schoolroom. Man, wow, they, and they show pictures up on the screen. Wow, but you know, uh, just occasionally, we'd have some missionary. It looked like he hadn't smiled since, you know, 1904 or something. I mean, he, he'd get up and he'd say, we don't have what you folks have over here in America. You know, I'd be a little eight-year-old boy and I'd be thinking, didn't you know that before you left? I mean, <laughs> you might want to do a little research next time before you go to Slovakia or whatever it is, you know? <laughs> and, then, and then he'd say, Will you pray for us. It looked, it looked like the whole time he was talking about his thing, it looked like he was almost sinking behind the pulpit, you know? Pray that we'll get some, you know, we need some new socks for our children. And, and my wife could use uh, some shoes. She goes barefoot all the time. And, you know, and he'd be talking about things. And then he'd have the audacity at the end to say, you boys and girls and you teenagers, why don't you give your life to God and come join me? You know, I was a little boy saying, I, I'm not going to join you. Not about to. You've lost the joy of living. And Peter is talking to people who are going through all kinds of sorrows and trials in every chair that occupies a human being in this room tonight. You're either, you just came out of a trial or you may be in the midst of one right now or you will soon be in one. You say, Morris, don't say that. Have you not lived long enough to know that's true? Life is filled with turbulent ups and downs and curves and things that you weren't prepared for. 
It comes physically, it comes uh, relationally, it comes in the family, it comes financially, it comes with your employment, it comes in any number of ways. Things come at you like, I don't understand this. You don't have to understand. God is not in heaven saying, oh man, oh, I got so much to do. I, oh, I lost control. I didn't, I didn't, oh, hey boy, he's gotten in a mess over there. It's because I got so busy. God's not calling a quick meeting with the Trinity saying, all right, how are we going to solve all this? God is sovereignly watching over your life and mine. He's not lost charge. He's not lost control. And so Peter says to God's people, cast all your care upon him. For he cares for you. Can I just quickly, and I mean this, can I show you some things from this one verse? Can you see, number one, there, there is what I call an inevitable reality. There is something that is inevitable. And it's a real thing. It's a reality. You say, what's that? You're going to have cares. That's what he's saying there. Casting all your cares. Peter is not saying... Now, some of you reading this letter, you're going to go through some trials. There are others of you, you know, you're going to get through life with very few trials. And you're, you're not even going to have any real difficulties. And so for you, just tolerate this for a moment while I talk to the handful of people. He's saying to all of us, you're going to have cares. Okay, now wait a minute. What does the word care mean? The word care, friend, is a word that means to be pulled in every direction. Does that not sound familiar? It's the idea of being choked out of life, which means it is, it, is the, it is the idea of anxiety. Are you ready? It means worrisome, to be full of worry, to be full of care. Peter, Paul said, be careful for nothing. That word careful means you take it apart and go the other way. Be full of care about nothing. Now, you may sit here tonight and you're not going through a trial. Everything is smooth sailing for you right now. And you may say, yes, sir, preacher, I believe that with all my heart. Well, you just hang on. The sad thing is some of us will forget this when confronted with care. But it is inevitable. And if there's anything that keeps us from having a spirit of genuine alertness and revival and refreshment in our life it's when we go through trials of life and we start saying where is God well he's never left he's right there and we get to the point where we're saying I don't understand it seems like everybody else is is living a life that's smooth and why does everything fall apart for me you don't know what other people are going through and you don't know what God is establishing in you. Remember the last verse we read, the next to last verse? He is strengthening you. He is establishing you. He is literally bringing you to a place of spiritual completion. He's carving things into your life. What's the point? It is inevitable you're going to have cares. Now, I'm pretty simple on this, but I want you to understand I'm convinced that cares kind of fall into three different types of categories. For some people, their cares come because of their past. In some cases, some of you are still dragging through life things that you did that you've asked for forgiveness of, you've asked the Lord to forgive you, but you're still dragging it along and you live with a spirit of insecurity, you live in a state of instability, and you, just, you go through life in a state of... I'm just not worthy of anything. And boy, God is probably furious with me because of what I did when I was a teenager, what I did when I was overseas. And what, oh, if I, if I hadn't gone to that college, if only I hadn't hung out with that group of friends, if only I hadn't taken that first drink, if only I hadn't gone online and looked at those first pictures, oh my. If only, if only. And you spend your whole life, the rest of your life in a state of disturbance and worry and fretfulness and a lack of peace with God because you're remembering your past. I love what the apostle Paul said. Paul said, brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press on toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I'm moving on. I look at David after he had committed the horrible, horrible, horrible sin of adultery. And at best, manslaughter. He called for the slaying of Uriah. 
one of his loyal followers who was the husband of the woman he had been adulterer, he had been in adultery with. And then when the baby was beginning to be born, David is on his face before God, pleading with God. And the, the baby was, was born, but the baby got ill and was about to die. And he's pleading with God for, for the baby to live, and the baby did not live. And the next verse tells us that David got up, washed his face, and went and, went and ate. And they said, well, how, how could you be so different? You were, you were so broken before. He says, well... You see, the truth is that baby will not come back to me, but I will join him someday. What was he saying? He was saying, yeah, I've got some things in my past that I'm sorry about. I hate it. But oh, blessed is the one whose sins are forgiven, whose transgressions are covered. Thank God for the forgiveness that I have received from the Lord. I have repented and, and God has forgiven me. For somebody in this room, it may be that there are things, not just that you did, or hear me, maybe things that were done to you. Maybe you were abused. Maybe there were some things in your past that literally you carry with you and you just kind of have a bitter edge and a quickness of temper. And all of a sudden, I mean, just the very mention of somebody's name, boy, I'm telling you, it's just right there. And you literally have lost the joy of living for the Lord. Why? Because of the past. Was there something evil, something that came to you that wasn't right? Probably, possibly. I don't know of anybody that has not been wronged. And hurt to some degree. But are you going to carry that around with you the rest of your life? When the Lord said, vengeance is mine, I will repay. Let me have it and let me defend you and you go on. Who would want your Lord if looking at you at work? Who, who would want to know your Savior if knowing you at school? Who would want to know uh, you're, you're, you're a follower of Jesus Christ if all they see is somebody who's just always kind of in the sad realm of living and they're always full of worry? Let me ask you something. Have you allowed the past to snatch away the joy of your Christianity? Sometimes it's the past. Sometimes it's not the past. It could be the present. Oh, my how am I going to pay these bills? How am I going to get everything done today that has to be done? I mean, I'm just being pulled in every direction. I, I, just, I just don't have time for this. And I don't have the time for these interruptions. And I don't have... Jesus sat down at a meal. He was about to have a meal at the home of Mary and Martha and Lazarus. And there was Martha fretting all over the kitchen and all over to where she just... Find, she rebuked Jesus. Can you imagine? Jesus, would you, would you make Mary get up and help me in the kitchen? I have so much to do. I can't rebuke Martha because I've been there. I don't know how many times. And Jesus had to, I mean, I think he had to slow Martha down. He calls her name twice, Martha, 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 chill. That, that's hidden in the Greek language, but I'm sure it's there. <laughs> Calm down, time out, Martha. You are full of care about so many things. And Mary has chosen the best part to come and just be still before me. Yes, there's work that needs to be done. But don't lose the joy of being near Christ as a result of it. Are you letting every day's pressures just eat you alive? I can't get it all done. I'm preaching more to me than I am to you right now. Peter said to God's people, it's inevitable. You're going to have cares, maybe from the past, maybe from the present, or maybe from the future. What's that? Well, it's those things that may possibly happen. And sometimes we start worrying. Oh, no. Oh, no. What if? What if that person gets elected? Oh, what are we going to do? I don't know. Trust God. What if that law goes into effect? I mean, seriously, Morris, it's going to change. Yeah, 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 it might change something. But wh what, if, what if my kid doesn't get out of geometry again this year? I mean, seriously, I mean, this is the fourth year that kid's been in geometry. What if my husband loses his job? His, his employer told him to come in to meet him tomorrow, and I'm just worried about it. One lady went up to her pastor one time and she said, Pastor, I'm convinced that worrying really does work. He said, what? She goes, I believe it works because I've discovered most of the things I worry about never happen. And so I think it must help. He said, no, ma'am, no, ma'am, no, ma'am. 
Worrying doesn't do anything. Worrying doesn't change anything except maybe the lining in your stomach, you know? Worrying doesn't work. And he says to God's people here, casting all your cares, you're going to have cares. It's inevitable. It's an inevitable reality. It's going to happen. Maybe from the past, maybe present issues, or maybe things that are happening in the future. When I was a boy, I used to sit down on the floor. I'd be playing with my baseball cards. Did you have baseball cards as a kid? Did you have a sister who threw them away? Okay, anyway, I'm not preaching on anger tonight. <laughs> I'd be playing my baseball cards, and uh, my mom would be working on some kind of a needle craft uh, cross stitching of some sort and she'd have this she'd be sitting in the chair and she'd be sticking needles in this tight piece of fabric and she'd be coming up and down and up and down up and down with this thread and, and with this needle and from my vantage point I looked up there and all I saw were ugly threads hanging down underneath and I said mom that sure is ugly you know just a loving son that I was I said that sure is ugly what kind of a mess is that and my mom would say you just don't see what I'm doing you can't see it. And I said, well, I don't know what you're doing, but it sure is ugly. And she would sometimes say, well, come over here and get close to me and you can see what I'm doing. And so then I would stand up and I'd get close to her. And then I'd look down from her vantage point and I could see a beautiful picture of maybe a river or a butterfly or whatever it was she was designing. From my vantage point, it looked ugly. But when I got close to her from her vantage point, it looked beautiful. And there have been times that I've said to the Lord, Lord, I don't know what you're doing. But it sure is ugly. I don't like this. God, what are you doing? And he says, you don't know what I'm doing. But let me work. Don't fight me. Number one, there's the inevitable reality. You're going to have cares. Number two, there's the instant response. What's that? The very first word of verse seven. Casting. Casting. It's inevitable. You're going to have cares. But the instant response, in fact, friends, the scriptures gives us the word casting here for a reason. It's a word that means, it means to throw something in a hurry. It means to get rid of it in haste. It's the idea of getting it off of you immediately. It means to be thrown with, with, with passion, with fury. It's the idea of saying, I don't want this. The idea, the image there is this. When God puts a care on my life or in your life, as soon as it comes into your life, you say, oh God, I don't know why this is coming, but you do. And I don't know why it's happening, but I'm going to walk and trust in you. I don't know. I'm casting. I don't, I, I don't have the strength to carry this. Now, that's one thing to explain it in, th in theory here tonight. It's another thing to practice it in reality. And I'm looking at some folks in this room. We play the yo-yo effect. When it comes to prayer, oh God, please take this burden. Take it off of me. It's too heavy. I can't handle this financial load. I can't handle this family burden. I can't handle this job situation. God, I can't handle Take it off of me. And then we pick it right back up. And like a yo-yo, we roll it down and we bring it right back up to us. And we walk away. We don't leave it at the Lord's hands. We bring it to him and then we walk around with it. Because we kind of want somebody to ask us, you know, what's wrong with you? Because we're wearing the weight of the world on us. Oh, you just don't know what I'm going through. You know, the sad thing is some, in some cases, when you're sharing uh, some sorrow to somebody else, what you're going through, they're just waiting for you to pause so they can tell you what they're going through. Oh, oh you think that's bad. Let me tell you what. The Bible says casting all your cares upon the immediate instant response is this. God I can't handle this. Take it. Take it. My son said to me on the phone, Dad, just go do what you do. You gave me the burden of taking care of mom. So don't worry about it. I got it. Now I wonder how many times our Lord looks at me and looks at you and he says, you don't have to understand what I'm doing. Just bring me that burden. Bring me that care. I got it. And just follow me. Trust me. I know what I'm doing. I know where I'm going. Don't get bitter 
When things don't go the way you want them to go, don't be bitter. Don't spend all your time blaming somebody else for the problems that you're going through. Refuse it. And be faithful to your God and wait for him to do what? Remember the verse before? Exalt you in due time. Verse 6 says, put yourself under the mighty hand of God that in time he may lift you back up off your feet and put you back on your feet. And as he said down there in, uh, in verse 10, he said that he will strengthen you, that he will establish you and strengthen you and settle you. What's the idea? The, the idea there is that he is going to make you more strong than you were before by going through a trial. You ask anybody who's gone through a difficult time, I mean a dark valley, you hear me. You ask anybody who's gone through a dark valley of a trial, you ask them, when did you grow the most? When you were going through that heavy trial? When did you grow the most spiritually? Going through those dark times or when everything was smooth sailing? They'll tell you in a heartbeat. It's when I couldn't explain what was going on and I just had to say, oh God, I don't understand. Lord, take this burden off of me. I don't get it. Casting. I think of, again, Hannah, who walked inside the temple worship center, and she said, oh, God, I want a son. I want a baby. I can't have a baby. Oh, God, I, I'm, I'm burdened down with, with, the, with the weight of being a woman, not having a child. I'm barren, and on that, it's not, I'm not I, I want a boy. Oh, God, what, and what was she doing? She was casting her care upon the Lord, and God heard her cry. I, I think about Jacob who after 20 years was coming back to the land of promise. And what did he do? He wrestled with the Lord all night long. Why? Because the next day he was going to see his brother Esau again. And the last time he saw Esau, Esau said, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill you for taking away the, the firstborn privileges. And he's scared for his life. He really is. He sends all these presents and gifts to his brother Esau. And he sends a servant to go find out how Esau had, uh, had, had taken uh, all the gifts. And the servant comes back and he says, uh, he received all the gifts, yeah. And he, he's coming to greet you with 400 men. And Jacob is thinking, I'm dead. I'm toast. It's all over. And so what does he do? He prays all night long, casting his care upon the Lord. Oh God, please. Oh God, please. I don't know what I'm about to face. And the next day Esau comes up to him and wraps his arms around him and he says, welcome home, brother. We have missed you. I think of the church in, in, in Acts chapter 12. They were burdened because Peter, who wrote this letter, was in prison and they were afraid they were going to take his head off and they were desperate. Oh God, please, don't take, don't take Peter away. We've already lost James. We don't want to lose Peter. And they were praying all night long if need be. God, deliver Peter. Oh God, please do it. What do you see? You see people casting their care upon the Lord and at midnight, knocking on the door, there was Peter. And they could, they made, when they opened the door and saw Peter there, the Bible says that they made so much noise, Peter had to tell them to be quiet. Shh, hey, 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 shh, hey. You know, hooping and hollering and high-fiving. I don't know if they did it. They, I'm sure they did the chest bump. I, I don't know, but I mean, they were pumped. Why? Because they cast their care upon the Lord. And the Lord heard them. How many more examples in the scriptures do you need? And yet tomorrow when that phone call comes, uh, next week when the doctor's report comes, uh, next time when that bill hits you in the mail, next time something else goes wrong, we go, what in the world? What? I, I don't understand. Casting all your care upon him. We see the inevitable reality. You're going to have cares. You see the instant response, casting. Here's my favorite part. Ready? You see the incredible reason. Why should we cast all our cares? Here's the incredible reason. For he careth for you. He careth for you. You can put your name there. In other words, Peter was saying, I'm writing to every single individual. He cares for you. When he said casting all your cares, the word cares is in the plural, which means every single one of your cares. 
It doesn't mean that you can't say, well, this one's probably insignificant to the Lord. This is not that big of a deal. There's nothing too big for the Lord. But we have a tendency to say, well, this is not as big a deal. So I'll, I'll try to solve this one myself. I'll work this issue out myself. I got a credit card for this one. I can do it. It's in the plural. It means every one of your cares. In other words, the Bible is saying, come to him. Here's what the writer of Hebrews said. Let us come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain grace and mercy in time of need. When? In time of need. Let us come boldly, which means a freedom of speech. In other words, you can just say whatever you want to say and say, God, I just need you. Why? Because he cares for you. It just helps to know somebody cares. And the obvious someone in this particular verse is the Lord. He cares. Did you know that he never takes his eye off of you? He never stops worry. He never stops wondering how you're going to get through. He's got his eye on you. He never, he never gets too busy with other people that he doesn't have time for your burden. The word cares are, is in the plural, all of them. And the word you is in the singular, which means what? You, 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 you. Peter is saying every individual one of you, he cares for you. It's incredible to think that he cares for you. A couple of years ago, I ran across this verse verse that I've heard so many times. Again, don't even have to look at it. Kind of got it memorized, do we not? Two, three years ago, I prepared a sermon on it. I went all the way through the book of Peter and was reminding people of what Peter was reminding us to do, to be worshipful and to be waiting for his return and to work for him. And then I got to 1 Peter 5, verse 7. Cast all your care upon him, for he careth for you. And then a year and a half ago, I'm sitting in a doctor's office after some x-rays, a couple of MRIs, a biopsy. And the doctor says, you have multiple myeloma. I didn't even know what those words meant. I actually asked him, is that cancer? He said, yes. And our world came to a screeching halt. The rug was pulled out from under us. I said, what are we going to do? He said, we're going to work on it. We're going to start fighting it. I said, how long is this going to take? I mean, I got churches and, and camps in the summer. And I got, I mean, that's my life. That's all I do. That's my employment. I don't have any. How long is this going to take? He said, it's going to take a few months. Yeah, like 12 months. An entire year. And he threw words out like transplant. I've heard that word for other people before, but never for me. Transplant. What? A bone marrow transplant. What? And the journey began. And the canceling of meetings began to take place. And all of a sudden, the only appointment I had was not a, do not a church appointment. But it was another doctor's appointment. And another pet scan and another test over here and another x-ray and another this and another that and and I'll be honest with you I had to find out if this was really true or not and I told the Lord there are certain verses that I'm going to anchor myself to and one of the first ones I clung to was 1 Peter 5, 7. Cast all my care upon him because he cares for me. I can tell you as real as many of you could testify tonight, it really is true. 
This last January, I sat in the doctor's office after a year, complete year, from January to January. January of this year, the doctor came in after taking another blood test. I've given more blood than I think I'm out of it. I mean, I don't think I've got any more to give. He walked in and he said, well, okay, you're in remission. And he looked kind of like, like it wasn't a good thing. And I'm in my heart saying, isn't that good news? I love that word remission. And the nurse looked at us and smiled and said, congratulations. And I thought, well, good. Somebody gets the truth of it. Doctors are all in drop dead serious, you know. I think he was afraid of losing a patient. I don't know. I, I don't know what his problem was. But I love the word remission. And I found it to be true that I would never want to go through again what all of 2018 brought my way. I would never want to go through it again. And I might have to, but I don't want to. But I would take nothing for the journey of this past year and a half of learning that if I cast all my care upon him, he really does care. <laughs> he really does care. And he pays the bills. And he miraculously takes care of his children. And in some cases, he brings healing. But his grace is in every place of the journey of life. And he says, I know you're having trouble with your employment. Cast it on me. I got it. You go, you go on and live your life and trust me. I got it. I know you're having a heartache over here with a family member. I get it. I understand. I allowed that into your life. Now you bring it back to me. I got it. And you, you, you live with joy and peace and rest in me. I know you're having a physical problem and you know you've got a doctor's report that's breaking your heart. And I realize that you've got, you've got some sorrow with regards to your finances. And I know that you're hurting over here in this area of your life. But now you cast that upon me. I, got, I allowed those issues into your life. Bring them back to me and draw close to me because I care for you. I have no idea for whom this might have been tonight. I repeat. You either just came out of a troubled storm, you may be in the middle of one right now, or you're about to enter into one. And I hope that you'll always hang on to this truth. And if there's anything that causes God's people to tap the brakes while living the Christian life, it seems like when trouble comes, we don't know what's going on and we lose the contented peace of knowing my God's in charge. Would you bring that sorrow to him tonight and leave it there? My son said, I got it, Dad. Now live your life. Would you bow your heads with me, please, tonight? Father, I pray for these dear friends tonight. I pray that you'll help each one of us to see what it is you're wanting us to see. And there may be some folks here tonight, they have no idea what they're about to go through. We all know what it is to have fears and worries and stresses, anxieties and cares of this life. Regardless of the age, those who are married, those who are not married, those who are retired, those who are young in the journey of life, every one of us know what it is to have cares. I pray, Lord, that you'll help us to understand that there's a reason why those cares have come. They've come as a result of you strengthening and establishing us and making us more like you. Help us to rest in you and follow you. Help us to continue this invitation tonight with your peace of mind. Our heads are bowed. Who here tonight would say, Morris, I don't know about the people sitting next to me. I don't know about the person in my family. I don't know about people behind me or in front of me. But I needed this reminder tonight. You say, preacher, God challenged me. God spoke to me. I needed this tonight. He knows I did. If that's so, would you lift your hand across the room? He gave me something I needed to hear tonight. Wonderful.
wonderful, wonderful. I'm going to do something a bit different tonight. I'm going to let you stay seated. So often we have an invitation in which we encourage people. We, we, first of all, we stand and then we plead with people to walk forward and get on their knees. If you want to get on your knees tonight, please help yourself and do so. I would never stop somebody from just doing that. But tonight, and this will be probably the only night I would do this. I don't know. I'm going to just ask you to stay seated and I'm going to ask everybody in the room to take some time with your Lord and say, God, I need to anchor myself in you like never before. And Lord, I want you to refresh my soul in these next three nights. Lord, I want you to feed me from your word and give me what I need to hear from your truth of scripture. And make me more like Jesus Christ. Lord, I want you to revive me. And then friend, if you have a care tonight, I want you to give it to him. Just lay it at his feet and say, I don't want to yo-yo this thing and pick it back up. I'm going to give it to you right now. As best I know how, I'm going to leave it there with you. And then friends, when you're through praying, I hope you're catching this. When you're through praying, then just stand up. The person next to you may pray longer than you. Don't feel guilty. It's not a contest to see who can pray longer. If the person prays longer than you, just stand up when you're finished. If, if the person next to you finishes before you do, don't feel rushed. You keep praying until you're finished talking to your Lord. Then you stand up. If you say, I don't really have that much to pray about, okay. You can stand up anytime you want to. I repeat, if you want to get on your knees, find a place to do so. I'm going to be quiet. I'll pray leave you alone and then just let you finish praying and you stand when you're finished and then your pastor will conclude whenever he sees fit. You take time with your Lord. Take that burden to him tonight and say, God, revive my heart during this meeting. Father, help these my friends as they seek your face. All the anxieties of life that eat us alive, that just bother us. Satan tells us, our adversary, that you're, you don't care. He, Satan whispers and says, God, God's left you behind. He, he, he doesn't have time for you. Lord, we know that's not true. He's trying to get us to believe that you're an angry God. You're not an angry God. You're a caring Lord. Now, Lord, encourage your people in the next few moments as they bring their family, financial, physical, uh, personal, emotional trials to you. Help them to cast upon you. And God, I pray that you really will give us a spirit of revival during these next few days. I know you'll hear your people as they pray. My friend, the time is there for you. You take time with your Lord. Stand whenever you're finished.